None of our clients have lost money due to your strategy. They came to learn how to help their clients uh, be protected from the next crack. It's, it's not a matter of if, it's when. True. And I think we're right around the corner from the next one, okay? But there is not a Roth around that if you have a million in there and you die, every million I have in my insurance contract will blossom to two and a half million instantly tax-free and transfer to my family bank. IRAs and 401ks used to be a good way. I think they're a far cry from that. Roths might be a better way, but max-funded insurance knocks, knocks the socks off of any Roth I've seen. It was 2005, I found myself at a Barnes & Noble. I said, you know, I'm frustrated with my personal finances. I'm frustrated at that time as a, a full-time insurance producer. I was figuring out how to strategize retirement strategies for my clients, myself, the people I love to care about. And then I stumbled across this book called Missed Fortune 101, flipped to the back. I said, I gotta get training by this guy because I was stuck in the bookstore just reading it. it was chapters 9, 10, 11 just gravitated toward me because there's certain dots in my financial career that I just wasn't unable to connect until I read this book, Miss Fortune 101. Make a long story short, I ventured to uh, Douglas Andrews' office in Salt Lake City at Paramount Financial, enamored by the salt water tank in his reception area, and I just said, you know what, this is a new home, this is a new, new way of thinking, a new paradigm I'm entering, and next thing you know, I went to three days of team training, and I started implementing these strategies and it absolutely changed my life. And if you know, you're watching this and you're looking for a, a time in your life, you're looking for a breaking moment, this was mine. So Douglas Andrew, uh, New York Times bestselling author, 10th, 11th book uh -huh. uh, of these right here. And we're doing this in San Mateo, California, out of our good friend Danny Singson's office, the Extreme One office. I'm just, I'm just excited to have this conversation with Douglas Andrew. Doug, thanks for coming out. You're most welcome, Matt. <laughs> I admire you a ton. You know, we've been going back now 14 years. 14 years, we've done seminars together, we've done training together, we've done a lot of things together. So, uh, Doug, you've been doing this for a while. So I, I came across your strategies in 2005, and then we started incorporating with our clients. The recession hits in 08, 09. Saves our clients the equity they had inside the homes. Because mm -hmm. we, we separated the equity from the product, because there were a lot of times people think right. that you know, my value in the house is, is my money. It's not, it's not your money, it's stuck in the value of the right. So using our strategy, we, for example, my mother's house, some of the family members are, are so our closest clients, they were able to save the value of the equity that was inside the house because the real estate market's important. Exactly. Same thing too with their 401k. When we rolled it over into an IRA, everybody else was losing on average. Uh, 2009 on average is a 49% loss. That's right. None of our clients have lost money due to your strategies, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, my mother's retirement, my, my mother's been a client of mine for 17 years. Through, uh, three recessions, 01, uh, dot com crash, uh, the, the 08, 09, the, those two crashes. Right. No losses, zero. She's on her third annuity contract. <laughs> I know it. Right? And, and if you remember, you know, none of our clients lost any money in 2001, 9 11, where from 2001 to 2003, most Americans lost 40% of the value of their IRAs sure. or 401k or their real estate or whatever. And it took four years. 2003 to 2007 to make back what they lost. So people had to put off retirement seven years. Now the reason why you and many others, 3,000 CPAs, tax attorneys, financial advisors came through team training mm -hmm. and invested six grand to learn my recipe. Dan Sullivan, my friend for 20 years, a uh, strategic coach, he said, Doug, you gotta sell your recipe. As you're writing these books, sell your recipe instead of selling the cake. Mm -hmm. You gotta make your competitors your customers and you'll reach more people. So that was the purpose of team training. And I brought in 18 million of revenue selling my uh, recipe to my competitors, right? Mm -hmm. Now, not all of them turned out like you did. <laughs> uh, different, different because of what you just said, mm -hmm. I was assuming they came to learn how to help their clients uh, be protected from the next crash. It's, it's not a matter of if it's when. True. And I think we're right around the corner from the next one, okay? Uh, I thought these advisors were going to um, implement these strategies with their clients. Well, in 2008, as Warren Buffett put it, when the tide went out, it revealed who was swimming naked, <laughs> is what he said. I thought these advisors were protecting their clients, uh, but they were swimming naked. And I said, wait a minute, your clients lost? And I said, what's up? And they said, well, we don't have time to educate people like you do, Doug. So we thought what the public wouldn't know wouldn't hurt them. We didn't think a major crash would happen again. No, in one single year, most Americans lost 
forty percent again. Yeah. Our clients didn't lose a dime. No. Our clients were cheering in two thousand eight. Yes. Like, go, 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 because they weren't losing. Sure. The first 90 days of 2009, most of our clients locked in gains of 16%, which was the cap at that time with our primary product we were using, uh, after not losing a penny. Most Americans took until 2012 to make back what they lost in 2008. It's the lost decade. Sure. So, yes, what's so incredible, if you had a million bucks that you spent your lifetime accumulated in the year 2000, and you left it in the market, and you lost, it went down to 600,000, 2001 to 2003, and it took till 2007 to come back to break even. In that seven years, just using indexing, uh, rebalancing with a cap, <laughs> the average caps, which were 12 or 13 percent of the time, the average was 7.23 percent. Worst decade, most decades you have seven uh, gain years versus three loss years. That decade we have five loss years. <laughs> That was a model of five years of zero. Only five years did you make money, and two of those years you were the only years you capped out. The average seven point two three percent rule of seventy two. Your million doubled to two million when most Americans were barely back to break even. Two thousand eight, it happens again. By two thousand twelve, the two million doubled again to four million. Most Americans were barely back to the million they started with twelve years earlier. I mean, how much more is four million than one million? I mean, people had 400% more money by following these strategies. And then by rebalancing and so forth, you can tweak your rate of return from 7.2% up to, I've averaged 10.07. So, uh, Matt, you took it and you implemented it. Sure. My hat's off to you. You know, and then the Roths came out, step in the right direction, but CPAs and tax attorneys, which I train, they said they were their mouths open. So they call a uh, max funded indexed universal life a, a rich man's Roth. And I go, rich man's Roth. Rich man's Roth, okay. <laughs> and I snicker because you don't have to be rich to own one, no, you know. But they call it that because the rich can't own a Roth. Okay, they make too much money or they, they, they want to put in 100, 200, 300 grand. You can't do that. Out from uh, the Roths give you tax free accumulation and tax free access. Max funded uh, universal life has those two benefits and three more that Ross will never have. Uh, I, there's no limit to what I can put in. If I want to throw in 100 to 200 to 300 grand in a single year and then not put anything in the next year, I can do that. Ross don't have that flexibility. I can throw in 100,000 and four days later go grab 80,000 of it. You can't do that with the Roth. You got to wait five years until you're 15 out and a half, all that stuff. But there is not a Roth around that if you have a million in there and you die. If I died flying back home tomorrow on the airplane, every million I have in my insurance contracts will blossom to two and a half million instantly tax-free and transfer to my family bank, my family, my kids, my grandkids, my church, my charity, the Boy Scouts, the Red Cross, whoever I leave it to. Why would you leave behind this when you could leave behind this? It doesn't cost me anything. Why would you generate this much income in retirement when you could generate double or triple that and not deplete your... See, it's funny when people don't know what they don't know because you can't be aware of something you're not aware of my hat's off to you matt because you stuck with it and even though it's hard sometimes to get people to well why isn't everybody doing this then sure how come i've never heard of this before sure and uh, you know I, I wish i had a nickel for every time i've heard that sure and uh, and we're doing this in financial literacy month this is april financial literacy month yeah so what do you think doug is the biggest enemy for the common Joe, if they financially want to get ahead? The biggest enemy, maybe, is overcoming the false belief patterns. Again, I still can't believe how many uh, young millennials or whatever, they're duped into putting in uh, tax deferred money in an IRA or 401k, being told they're going to be in a lower bracket. And I go, come on. No, that's not true. Or that, um, put your money in the market, the market always comes back. Mm -hmm. Well. What if you had a system where every time the market went up, you benefited, but if, when the market went down, you didn't lose? Why, why, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, you know I'm not a gambler. No, no, no. I have not put a nickel in a slot machine in Las Vegas in, in 40 years, okay? Sure. But frankly, I've said this before. If, if I went to some casino and they said, Mr. Andrew, welcome. Uh, we just want you to relax. And so here's the deal. We have a special uh, room over here for you and you can play all day long in this casino. And uh, 
And if you make money, you can keep 100% of everything you make up to a cap every, you know, every day. It will only we'll cap you at what you can make. But, but if you lose, we guarantee you'll walk out of here every day with what, what you walked in with. <laughs> I think I'd play in that casino. <laughs> See, that's indexed universal life. Yeah, you know? sure. And uh, and so the advice is still um, in my circles. Of course, it's very common. But when I go teach advanced continuing education to CPAs and tax attorneys, and some advisors who think they know it all, and they t and they tune out and they're telling the millennials or or, or or older people, and I go, whoa, 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 what what's your premise for that? What makes you think that? And it's, so it's overcoming some of the false belief patterns that are still drilled into people today about the best way to save or the best way to uh, create safety. You know I'm big on, well, my, my most recent book is called The Laser Fund. LASER is an acronym I've used for years, Liquid Assets Safely Earning Returns, called LASER. And if you want to pass the liquidity safety rate of return test, on any asset like your mother's home equity. Sure. See, my house went down in value in 2008 uh, from a million, what was it, a million five down to a million one in one single year. And I had some short sighted people that still didn't understand that because I had my money over in my insurance policies. And I had my house mortgage with the first, second, and third mortgage, okay, to the hill. And some uh, people, uh, critics, would go, oh, neener, 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 you're underwater. You owe more than your house is worth. I said, who's in control, me or the mortgage company? I have money over here earning three times what my net mortgage cost is. My mortgage at the time was uh, 3%. Tax deductible and that cost of two, and I'm making ten. Sure. I said, how much more is ten than two? Don't say eight. It's five hundred percent more. Okay. I said, listen. During this recession, banks borrow our money when we put it in there at one percent, and they turn around and put it into the same AAA rated insurance company where I put my money, and they make five percent without even linking to an index. They make five hundred percent. On every million, they pay 10 grand of interest annually and they make 50,000. Would you buy a widget machine for 10 grand that made you 50 grand? Would you hire an employee for 10,000 that made you 50? That's all I'm doing with my money. You're so what I was earning on my home equity that wasn't even there for eight years before my house came back to full value, I was earning 100 to 500% more than the cost of the mortgage. I was making money, so they didn't even get it. So I think some of the myths and false belief patterns are still out there, and that's why I write books and, and get on the radio, to find the people who want to pay attention and learn. Uh, it, you know, I have a little ditty, good, better, best, never let it rest. Never let it rest, no good is better, better gets best. IRAs and 401ks used to be a good way. I think they're a far cry from that. Roths might be a better way, but max funded insurance knocks, knocks the socks off of any Roth I've seen. So I like the best way. And, a, and the best way in that worst 12 year period quadrupled my client's money when most Americans were barely back to break even. Right. So it's not just saving money, it's where you're saving the money. That's the key. Where you're saving yeah. and how to overcome this myth that Oh no, no, the best rate of return is to have your money in the market. Sure. Defer, defer. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with tax down the road. No, no, it's not working. Yeah. You know, when it came to team training, you, you, expo you exposed to me the story of the, the, the Vanderbilts, the Rothschilds, understanding what the Rockefellers done to create wealth. What fascinated me was, you know, I studied, I was starting the, uh, the Vanderbilts. And they ended up selling off all their steamboats and got involved in the railroad industry. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and I'm just thinking about that. That was a very, Big time of change for the Vanderbilt family as well as the country. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, this family fortune was created for the steamboats, and he says, "Okay, I'm here to cut loose and sell everything up. I'm going to go to the railroads." Do you think that's a that's a that's reflective of the time that we're at today? Where you know what? Let me, let me uh, cut loose what was working and let me incorporate something that is going to get us to the other side of the country a lot faster, a lot smoother. Yeah, very very much so. I think Dan Sullivan, who has coached over 6,000 world's top entrepreneurs, and he created the series that you were familiar with on creative destruction. Sure. 
which is a term that Joseph Schumpeter uh, coined because he said what happens is many times when you get uh, a good thing going, you have many times the regulators come in and people and they want to, and all of a sudden they creatively destroy a very good thing. So, for example, I, I remember there was a small handful of bad apples that um, were trying to use the strategies in my first couple of books. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, I never met this person before, but apparently he was handed a book and he read it and he, and he got a, a universal life insurance policy. Then he, uh, he read the book and I didn't tell him to do this, but he, he, he took equity out of his home, but he, this is where he, he took his equity, he consumed. No, I said, if you're gonna do that, you gotta conserve, not consume. He used it for a divorce, he bought an RV, um, he, he, he finished his home off and uh, he put a little bit into his insurance policy, <laughs> but not enough. Yeah, right. Okay, so he's minimum funding all the money he had earmarked, and it wasn't working. But he actually had more money in there than because his house went down in value. But uh, you know, some of these attorneys they, they get hold of him and they said, "Oh, just just act like uh, you were given wrong advice and you read the book." Now, you know, I have a First Amendment right of free speech. Sure. What happens is they were uh, they wanted to say. Life insurance is not an investment and accordingly should not be purchased as an investment. And I went, really? I can agree with that because it's not. Because back in 1980 when E. F. Hutton, who was credited with being the brainchild of that, uh, they said, oh, well, uh, no, let's, uh, let's do the opposite. Let's take the minimum amount of insurance the IRS will let us get away with and put in the most premium that turns into this cash cow for living tax-free benefits. It was brilliant. And so it was like buy term invest the difference under a tax-free umbrella, it was pretty incredible. Well, as you and I know, the IRS said, what are you doing? And they came in in 1982 and said, uh, we think uh, you're not a tax-free insurance policy, we think you're an investment and it should be taxed. If you want it to be tax-free, you've gotta have a commensurate amount of life insurance attached to it. So I often will say, and it's in this book, I'll stand in front of an audience and I'll say, what would you call something? that you put money into, and it grows at a really safe, predictable, compounded rate of return, averaging seven to 10%, some years higher, some of it averaging seven to 10% tax-free. That if you get into any type of a pickle and emergency with an electronic funds transfer or phone call, you can access money out of there, tax-free. And uh, ultimately, whether you're a business owner or let's say you're a retiree, every million you accumulate tax-free now will generate 70 to 100,000 a year of tax-free cash flow into perpetuity through generations to come without completing that nest egg. What would you call that? And usually somebody on the front row goes, a miracle! <laughs> uh, a godsend in this topsy-turvy world. And I said, yes. you're right on, man. It's, it's the dream solution for college funding or for your real estate or for your business or for retirement planning or emergency planning or, or estate planning, whatever. But apparently, creative destruction will not let us call it an investment. You can call sending your kids to college an investment. We live in a world, Matt, where uh, the creative destruction of what regulators and law firms force you to say, the poor public is sitting there going, I've never heard of this. Well, yeah, because I can't tell you in the language they want me to tell you or you wouldn't get it. So I let my licenses go because an author is an authority on a subject. And I'm an authority on this and I can teach this and I can teach it to CPAs. And so I just teach and then I point my clients to the wealth architects who get it. This is more relevant uh, today than ever. And yet uh, there are still straight jackets put on a lot of the ways that you can teach it to people. Isn't that sad? Sure. You know, in 2005, you brought up a concept to me. You said, you know, in our country, what do you want to do to our country? Do you want to lower the taxes so therefore the GDP, the gross revenue, of our, com of our company goes more back into people and you and you have a bigger base to tax. Right. Versus the opposite, you raise the taxes and you just take a larger percentage, but you reduce the amount that's, that's taxed overall. Exactly. What would you rather, what would you rather do? And I think today, where, uh, where capitalism and socialism is such under fire, I've realized that what you were teaching at that time was capitalism. 
to take a little bit of money and make the most out of it. And as an entrepreneur, I can keep more of my money without having to pay in tax. I'm finding myself as I get as I get a little bit more educated about how to vote and who to vote for, mm -hmm. voting in those directions who allows me to keep more of my money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's really interesting, Mac, because you, you live in Chicago. Chicago. Okay. I remember several years ago when I was a keynote speaker in front of a thousand business owners. And um, again, this is not a political agenda that I'm saying this, but it was right after President Obama had basically said, you know, we're going to do this and that and the other. And, and so certain states will either choose, well, let's, uh, let's cover all these government things. Let's get more and more government programs and make people more reliable. Let's let government try to solve everything and we're going to raise taxes. Whereas the other philosophy is, well, let's just uh, let people become more self-reliant, have the minimum amount that uh, police and, and school teachers over, but let's raise the revenue that's being sure. taxed, okay? Sure. And so they had announced a tax increase in Illinois, and <laughs> the previous speaker to me said, how many of you business owners are planning on leaving Illinois this next year? And a sea of hands went up. And they were, where were they going? To Wisconsin, where at the time Scott Walker says we're lowering taxes and we're deregulating. And he turned around a deficit in one single year. But going back to what you just said, only 5% of Americans will go out and take the risks to be an entrepreneur. Non-entrepreneurs many times will say emphatically, well, I, I, I will never do that. I will never take the risk that you take. Mm -hmm. What's ironic is they also say, but I don't want you getting the benefits from you taking risks if you succeed. It's a little like, what? So you want the benefits if we succeed, but you don't want to take any risk. You want somebody else to do that. It's sort of like Steve Jobs, you, you know, you're, you're evil. You didn't build that, and we did by buying your iPods. No, Steve Jobs, he didn't invent the, the cell phone. He just said, no, I'm gonna create a, a, a platform and he has 1.3 million other apps. I mean, on his app, he has three other apps or things that you can do on a smartphone, okay? Sure. He didn't invent the MP3 player. He just told his daughter, you're gonna have a thousand songs in your pocket. And he creates an MP3 player he calls the iPod. He just made a better mousetrap. And he learned by taking criticism. When people, when he came out with the uh, iPad, you remember? People went, what? You've got tablets, you've got PDF. Why do you need this tablet? And so what happens is, Jobs, he created this platform, and it could be used for good or evil. Okay? He learned that when people criticized the iPod, well, I'm a jogger. He used to take offense to that. Now that's his R&D. He came out with a nano. Sure. And then people said, well, I, I, would want, I want something to clip on my shorts. Thank you. So he made a clip. I have all of them, and I'm a Microsoft guy. So I appreciate what Steve Jobs did, and an entrepreneur is just somebody, according to John Baptist Say, a French economist, an entrepreneur just takes something from a lower level of productivity to a higher level of productivity. And it's what makes the world go round. And so, yes, that's capitalism. Socialism, many times, of course, they, they want to be taken care of from the cradle to the grave, but I think it was Margaret Thatcher who said, the problem with socialism is pretty soon, you run out of other people's money. <laughs> yeah. Boom. Boom. Speaking of uh, the different ways to make money, you know, you taught me back then, there's ordinary, passive portfolio type income. Mm -hmm. Mitt Romney, when he was running for president, he shows his tax returns, 20, I think it was 21, 23 billion dollars, but his effective tax rate was much lower than his assistant which is, I think it was a 35% mm -hmm. because of how he made his money. Exactly. Can, can you explain a little bit about that? Because I think a lot of people get confused. Well, this guy is a multi, multi deca millionaire, and yet his ascent is at maybe $60,000, $80,000, but more of our money is taken out versus this, this guy's risk, and they're blaming the rich people. Oh, yeah. yeah. And before I answer that, <laughs> can I just tell you the first thing I looked at when I saw his tax returns compared to Barack Obama's? Hmm. Barack Obama's tax return had less than one half of 1% of his income went to charitable donations. Wow. Mitt Romney had like 23% of his income went to charity. Wow. I saw that instantly. Now the media never pointed that out. They were looking at, look at this evil guy that makes all this money. Look how much he gives back. Anyway. So, yeah, ever since 1986 tax reform, there's only three types of income you 
report on your 1040 tax return. And if you haven't filed your taxes yet, this is the first year in many years that uh, your taxable income is not on line 43, one third of the way back in the back of your return. It's on line 10 on the front page now. Now, the Trump tax cuts uh, were the biggest tax cuts since 1986, which was the second term of Reagan. And Reagan believed in, no, it's better to raise the revenue that's being taxed by actually lowering taxes. But he actually, uh, by lowering the marginal rate down, the effective tax people paid by, by he did away with some of the deductions, went from 13% up to 19%. But see, earned passive or portfolio income are the only three incomes that appear on the front page. Now, one of the reasons I love Max Funded Index Universal Life is because uh, here in the Bay Area, many times I'd have clients that came in and they'd say, okay, uh, we have uh, 200,000 a year of income for retirement based on our portfolio here. 40,000. Social Security, 160,000, our IRA, 401ks, our rental income, real estate, or whatever. And I'd look at that and go, whoa, it's all showing up on your tax return. And they went, well, you know a way so it won't? And I go, yeah. See, only earned passive and portfolio income shows up on your tax return. So in a period of five years to comply with Tamra, many times I would convert up to 60% of their retirement income. See, at retirement planning is totally different than what you did for retirement. So I do a strategic rollout, which is a term that I coined, and I would do a rollout and get their money out of their IRAs or 401ks, out of the market, uh, or maybe liquidate their real estate, or get their real estate out of the Bay Area, where a, a five-bedroom home, one of our clients has a five-bedroom home they bought for 200,000 40 years ago in Palo Alto, it's worth 4.6 million and they were thumping themselves on the chest oh we rent this out for 10,000 a month we may get 12,000 a month and I looked and I said that's pathetic and they went what now do you know that their five bedroom homes in Memphis Tennessee were 300,000 the rent for 1% of the fair market value it rents for three grand a month your $4.6 million house should be renting for $46,000 a month. See, in the Bay Area, your real estate is up here, but your cash flow is 1% or 2%. It's pathetic. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we've had clients do uh, uh, sell and do 1031 exchanges, or they're tired of being a landlord, uh, evicting tenants, taking out trash, and, and, and uh, fixing toilets. And whatever they do, if they sell and they convert and put it into, even paying a capital gain tax, they put it into max funded insurance contracts, they're shocked. Their cash flow is greater than the rental income and they don't have to be a landlord anymore. Or they do 1031 exchanges and we four times their cash flow and now they have this extra cash flow to put into their insurance policy and they start converting to tax-free income. And they're just like blown away. Where have you been? And so what happens is these couples in five years, they would still end up with 200,000 of income, but 120,000 of it no longer shows up on their tax return. Nice. Because money in their insurance contracts is not deemed earned passive or portfolio income. And so I was saving them 30 to 40 grand a year of taxes. They live 20, 25 years, and I saved them a million bucks of unnecessary tax. I've done this double and triple that. We saved uh, a husband and a wife 1.2 million of tax. They still had to pay 1.2, but their accountant, when, when we said, they're going to pay 200, uh, 2.5 2. million of unnecessary tax on these IRAs and 401ks. You know what their accountant said? They can afford it. Mm. You wouldn't believe how many times I've heard that. Whoa. I'm going, now, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. Uh, if I show the uh, list of where uh, the government uh, puts our money, but I don't show the percent, and I say, here's where the government puts our tax dollars, write down what percent, if you could choose, your tax dollars should go to this versus this versus this, and it never comes close. I don't care what political affiliation. It never comes close to how the government is spending our money, and I just go, how did we get here? So if you want to take ownership and direct where, redirect otherwise payable taxes, uh, I save people a million dollars in unnecessary tax, and they set up their own family bank, and now they can fund uh, their family vacations with a purpose and all kinds of things, or their charitable giving. And uh, they'll do more for this great country than just rolling over paying unnecessary tax. Going back to your question, Mitt Romney still doesn't even understand all that. Sure. 
but he did understand that a lot of his income was passive income or portfolio income. And uh, he did have some IRAs and 401ks, but see, he had the ability to redirect otherwise payable taxes to causes he supported. He actually is help, was helping out America far more, but the media climbed all over him and made it sound like, look how evil this guy sure. is. Look at all the money he's got. And to me, I'm going, he just gave sure. millions yeah. to these causes that are going to help out this country and people way more than paying extra tax would have done. I can prove that economically all day long. And so, see, it's choice and control. A lot of people just flat out give up choice and control. And the neat thing is when you take ownership, you'll take better care of anything. When you own a home, you'll take better care of it. When was the last time you ever washed a rental car? Or the oil Never. Rental? Yeah, you don't yeah. watch rental cars. You don't watch rental cars. The secret to American wealth is ownership. Deeds, titles, and articles of incorporation. And I love this country. And I. I, it drives me crazy to see us fostering a younger generation that wants government to do everything for them from the cradle to the grave. No, Doug, the thing, when I see TV and I see HGTV, which glorifies what people do in real estate, yeah. and I see Fox Business and MSN Money and, and uh, you know, all these uh, stock traders and they're glorifying how you, know, you can make a lot of money in our economy, you know, be a trader. Uh -huh. uh, and then you see you know, uh, all these different uh, uh, courses online and Bitcoin and Forex trading type of stuff. And then we get to the insurance industry and there's the industry has done a horrible, in my opinion, a horrible job of communicating its value. What is the biggest misconception that people have with the life insurance industry? I'll tell you, it's the stigma that insurance is a, ne is a necessary evil, that it's an expense. I'll give you a classic example that happened last week with, with a judge here in California. Mm -hmm. There was a, a guy that went in and he had a max funded insurance contract and uh, he had uh, several million dollars in other assets and so he set up an insurance policy to reposition 500 grand or a million dollars over five years to comply with Tamara to avoid a max so it's going to be tax free. That was his purpose. Most of my clients didn't ever come to me uh, wanting or needing life insurance for the death benefit only, okay? I mean, it's nice, that should be, you, you gotta have a reason and justification for the death benefit, but see, when all of a sudden you flip that, which is what E.F. Hutton said, is well, wait a minute, life insurance is the only financial instrument in the Internal Revenue Code that allows you to accumulate your money tax-free, Section 72E, Access that money tax free, 7702, and when you die, it blossoms in value and transfer tax free. Municipal bonds don't do that. And so when EF Hutton realized that, they said, why don't we do the opposite? Why don't we take the least amount of insurance the IRS will let us get away with and put in the most money as fast as the IRS allows? And that's Temper Temper Tamara. And let's take the minimum amount of insurance, put in the most money, and it turns into a cash cow. And this judge, looked at this guy whose attorneys were trying to get a full refund of his premiums. Okay. This is the ironic thing. He goes, so what are you wanting? And the attorney says, well, we would like the insurance company to refund 100% of his premiums. <laughs> and my, and I, we, I wasn't there, but my attorneys go, so if he gets a full refund of all the premiums he's paid the last seven years, uh, that's way less than if he just cancels the policy. And the attorney went, huh? What kind of insurance is worth more than what you paid into it? He didn't know. He didn't know. And the judge says, well, well wait a minute, wait a minute. This guy makes 75000 a year right now. And the, the, the premium on this policy that he was putting in was 57000 That was not suitable. You took advantage of this poor senior citizen. See, the stigma was the judge thought Everybody buys life insurance and pays premiums for the death benefit out of their income. He had no clue. This guy was repositioning a million dollars out of non-performing real estate, money earning 1% of the bank, money. Uh, or, or losing money in the market. He was, re he was funding the insurance. He funded it through this, not out of income. But the judge at first said, Oh, I don't want to hear any more. That was not suitable for that guy to sell him that, uh, that expensive of an insurance policy. That's the problem, Matt, sure, sure. is the illiteracy of one of the most powerful financial instruments 
And still we have people in power that go, who would ever do that? That was stupid, that was unsuitable. Yeah. Refunding his money. Well, if we refund him his money, it will be less than, he's doubled his money in this thing. And they go, huh? See, they don't get it. And so that's the trouble is trying to, you know, hello. Right. Yeah. So, so Doug, doing this now 45 years. I've been doing this now going on 20 years. In this era, in this day and age, uh, according to Libra, there's 150,000 insurance agents left in our industry, down from 500,000 in, in, in the 1970s. 500,000 down to? 150. Well, yeah. And the, the average agent today is a 60 year old Caucasian. Right, there's not enough multicultural in our industry, yet our country is becoming more multi multicultural. In this era, with lack of education, lack of literacy, lack of outreach to our multicultural demographics, why would you recommend somebody get involved in the industry? Because the people that watch our videos are people that are considering this industry. I'm a fence. I got some military veterans out there. What do you do after the military? I got some people out there saying, you know, my, my job sucks, but I really like what I'm seeing on YouTube. Why would you recommend somebody to get involved in the industry and why? Because of what Dan Sullivan calls big O, little C. Most people in life go through their whole life with big C, little O, more capability than they have opportunities. And they don't even see the opportunities. All they see is challenges. This is, you flip that and all of a sudden you have more opportunities than capabilities. Yeah, it's challenging to get people to change their mind from following the herd, putting money on tax deferred IRAs, 401ks in the market, but it's worth it. The opportunities are incredible. Because when we only have this much of a army educating America on the right way to optimize assets, when it takes ownership for your own future, uh, those messengers who bring that to Americans who want to take ownership for their future, they'll be compensated, they'll be blessed, they'll be held. Uh, Yesterday in Morgan Hill, uh, I was teaching the first 90 minutes and this elderly couple walked in that came last fall, six months ago, and said, can we just stand up and say something? And you're always a little bit nervous, like, what are you gonna say? And he's an architect and he showed me his, uh, uh, who is it? Is it Frank Scott Lloyd Wright? Scott uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Wright. Uh, yeah, he's up down in Morgan. It was gorgeous, and he's an architect. And he stood up and he says, "I'm 75. I came here last fall." He says, "I'm probably the most skeptical person that Mr. Andrew has ever had in any." Event. He said, "I was so skeptical, and I just took my wealth architect and I questioned everything. Prove it." Da -da 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 -da. And so he went through this process and all of a sudden he said, and you know what, nobody has ever taken the time to help us understand and overcome these false belief patterns we've had. Life insurance? And he said, I am so glad that somebody is out there doing what you're doing because the world needs you. He said, I've had two heart attacks. He said, but I'm doing great. And my agent went to bat for me with the underwriters and he said, I got approved and I'm putting in X million. And he says, we feel more at ease and peace now because we have our insurance policies in place. We're gonna be able to generate several hundred thousand a year of tax-free income. We got our family bank. We've set up our trust with equal opportunities instead of equal distribution. He said, thank you for leading a crusade because I was your most skeptical prospect and now I'm singing praises. <laughs> and he stood up and said that in front of all these people. So those who are interested in changing people's lives, this isn't about a transaction. Slam, bam, thank you, ma'am. What's your name, address, social security number, write out a check. This is about transformation. This is about giving people a hope for a brighter future, to not worry about money, to be able to sleep at night, to be able to fund their future and their kids and their grandkids and family retreats with a purpose and not worry about money. Because at the end of the day, you don't take it with you. But you could do so much more blessing people's lives by educating them and helping them understand things that they've never uh, learned before and get them out of that uh, trap. So here's the key. Yeah, <clears throat> we have unique products, but it's not about that. The one rung up on the ladder from that is exceptional service. That's as high as most 
advisors ever get. They return phone calls. They say what they do they're going to say. They, 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 they say please and thank you and they finish what they start. You can't believe how many advisors don't even do those four things. Those are called referability factors. Most contractors don't understand that. They wonder why they don't get referrals. But when you go up to a unique experience, see people come to us because it's a unique experience. We take time to educate them. We're sincerely interested in their future and their greatest fears, not just about getting a check. But the highest rung is a meaningful transformation. You'll have the highest compensation with the least competition if you provide a meaningful transformation. Get involved in the insurance industry. Uh, make, this make this industry. industry is one of the few that you can actually provide a meaningful transformation. I teach some of the nation's top dentists, orthodontists, oral surgeons, okay? They can do it with a smile. And I say, you know what? You can make a meaningful transformation in somebody's smile. And you can go, oh, wow, that's a gorgeous smile. And that gives people confidence. It doesn't even hold a candle to the meaningful transformation you and I make doing what we do. There is no other profession that changes lives and saves lives like ours does. Whether people live or die, and I hand a two or three million dollar check, and a widow is crying in gratitude, and she doesn't have to worry about maintaining her dignity anymore, because she got this incredible death benefit, even though her husband was planning on staying around and, getting, and providing tax-free income out of this. My own brother died at age 50 in a rollover accident, and delivering a tax-free death benefit to his widow and then putting that back into a new insurance policy on her has provided her with peace of mind for 20 years that no amount of money in an IRA or 401k or anything like that would have ever come close to do, ever. 100%. Okay. Yeah. Doug, you know, so appreciative of your time, very generous of your time, and we're going to wrap things up. Um, I followed your path in 2010 and it just allowed my licenses to expire. And, uh, and I've been, it was kind of odd for me because it was at that time it was 12 years. And I, I, I was living and breathing on my licenses. Yeah. And so we've created that recipe where we started recruiting and building an organization, building a team, scaling up and out. And uh, we started with 27 guys and over 2,000 ages across the country. Way to go. And then, boom, boom. There you and, go. Uh, yeah. thank, thanks to you and your, your guys you, and you opening my mind. Oftentimes people are getting off in this industry, they're starting off. Any pros of wisdom from you on uh, uh, best suggestions for them to get their new career, to get their new business started inside this industry? Never um, forget that it's not about you, it's about them. And as you're sincerely interested in them, and helping them have that brighter future and get vision, overcome the obstacles, create a transformation and give them the step-by-step -step action steps. You will be more than a financial advisor. You will be probably one of their most regarded uh, friends, uh, confidants uh, on the planet because you weren't there just trying to get a commission check with a financial transaction. You transformed everything for the better, for them, their family, their loved ones. Now, to transform our lives, where can we find more information and order your books? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this is my t 11th uh, book. My next one is uh, on 10 keys on how to 10 times your entrepreneurial practice in less than 60 months. I'm excited about that one. Nice. Uh, every other book now is financial, the other one. But this one is the Laser Fund, which is actually two books in one. And uh, you can get this by going to uh, liveabundant.com. But I think even if you go to Laser Fund, you just pay shipping. I think of five bucks or 5.95 or something, and we'll send you a free copy. This book here uh, is actually two books in one. And uh, the, this side, uh, this is what I learned for many years uh, teaching. This book is uh, 200 pages and it's the left brain, charts, graphs, explanations at three different levels of depth. How, uh, uh, if they like all the detail, they're engineers, they can get it right there. But oftentimes the other spouse made decisions more matters of the heart, how they felt. They're more right brain. So they flip it over and they read it this direction. And this is 100 pages comprised of 12 chapters containing 62 chicken soup for the financial soul stories. 
These are actual client stories. We changed the names except for from, from some of them who, who wanted their name in there. Okay. And uh, it's how to use max funded insurance, which I call the laser fund, uh, for everything from college funding to emergency funds, retirement planning, business planning, working capital, blah, 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 to see the versatility of why I use life insurance for so many things that most people don't even think of. It's been a hit. This one is about entitlement abolition, how to abolish entitlement mindset. This book has been in me for 40 years and uh, now it's picking up a ton of traction. And, and you can get this by going to entitlementabolitionbook.com and you just pay the shipping postage and I'll send you a free copy of that book. And chapter 10 in this book is the best white paper I've ever written on max funded insurance. There's only one chapter on insurance. But it's the best white paper on insurance. This book is totally talks about it every which way possible. This is a, a reference book, whether you want stories or you want charts and graphs as deep as you want to go. So that's the last two. I love it. Hey, make sure you go get your book. <laughs> Doug, I appreciate you coming down. I appreciate your time and appreciate your wisdom. Again, and you just sharing some of those things, just maybe refresh some of the fundamentals you've trained me. I'm so glad. Uh, yeah, I picked up your book at Barnes & Noble 2005, and I'm glad you're still in my life today. Wow, thank you. Sure. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad you did too. 100%. Yeah. If you've been watching this and you got a couple of nuggets, please drop your comments, thoughts, feedback below. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe. If you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page. That being said, I'm your money smart guy. I'm going to have to do this. Andrew, New York Times bestselling author. Until we meet again, continue to smart, continue to smart, and be money smart today.